So some of our top clients are uh, GG Nation. They just raised like three mil or something like that. We have Growth School, who's using Scenes. Uh, we now have. Um, uh, companies in the US like Wings of the World, we have companies in the U in Canada like one of our investors, Pure Plays, who uh, kind of jumped on scenes. We're at about 400k revenue, we're adding about 30 to 100k of new revenue every month, right? In fact, by the end of next month, we're expecting to be at around 600ish k, right? With just in, in terms of pipeline, uh, growing pretty fast. Uh, every month, it's like very consistent. Sales team, the report, I can sort of predict it, right? Looking like yeah. at the start of the month, they predict, I mean, they tell me what the pipeline is, end of the month, they close, and it's like such a predictable number right we even know the conversion percentage uh, it's a very cac driven business so you spend money and then we get a customer and then you know whatever they go through the motions we have a sales motion after uh, the customer discovers us uh, so yeah i mean we're doing very well why do they use us two reasons right i think we have two very specific icps the uh, like personas the first persona is like creators uh, these are people like ankur variku for example ankur variku uses scenes finance with sharon uses scenes um, for them it's same problem that I had, right? We have an audience on YouTube. We want to own that audience, right? For once, we want to own the, the the distribution that we have. Otherwise, you don't own it, right? It's just you're renting it from YouTube or yeah. Instagram or whatever. So very, very obvious use case for them. And eventually, they'll monetize with courses, right? And Scenes has the infra to, to, to do courses as well. Um, and on the other hand, I think if you, if you look at um, uh, businesses, right? For example, now we're doing uh, a pilot with Monster Jobs, right? Where you, they just went live yesterday. And if you look at them, for them, it's like we have high DAO. We want to convert that into retention, right? And for some uh, businesses, it could be GTM, right? Like it could be, hey, we just want to have like this is one company called Nova HQ that uses us where they just want to have people engaging and then they'll find a way to monetize it. They're very similar to how we did it, right? On our Discord. So very three different use cases, I would say three, like, Two different personas, but three different use cases. And every day, the, the fact that scenes is so complex and vast, you can even do things like custom CSS. Right? You can make it look like your own platform. Because it's so vast, you can use scenes in any, any way. Right? So every day we get surprised with new use cases where we didn't predict it. Right? It just came on the platform by itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're growing pretty fast. And right now it's like, if we spend X, we know we can make Y. Right? So it's now a question of, how much X to spend and should we raise money for it? And those sort of second order questions, I guess. Hi everyone. Before we begin, I would like to share that this podcast is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amir Sumani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Soni. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category defining tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as MyGate, Quizzes, Planet Spark, Bolt and Clip. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. Hi, this is Siddharth Aluwalia. Welcome to 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. Today I have with me Varun Maya, founder of Scenes, one of the largest products for creating communities by content creators, by enterprises. Varun is also a very well-known content creator on YouTube, on Twitter, Warren started his journey in entrepreneurship at the age of 19 by founding a company called Jobspire, which is now acquired. Today in this episode, we'll deep dive into Warren's own journey, his mental models, his frameworks, and how he manages to balance a startup and journey of a content creator with having more than 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And Warren has one of the most intelligent audience on YouTube. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, would love to know your journey before entrepreneurship. Where did you grow up? Your parents, their background, uh, and your education. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I grew up in Bangalore. Like I've been a Bangalore boy all my life. The only time I ever left Bangalore was uh, to study. I went to Manipal, uh, the Bangalore one. And my mom's a, a CA, my dad's a, a doctor. So they both come from like, so my mom comes from Udupi. My dad comes from this place called Bantwal. It's a village, right? So they did okay for themselves because they kind of sort of accelerated from, you know, a tier two, tier three sort of ecosystem. And then finally made it to Bangalore, right? Which is a big thing in those days. Uh, gave me the kind of platform to be able to at least, you know, finish my college and, and uh, you know, they, they get, I think the best thing my parents ever did for me was they gave me a computer very young. So age of seven, I was gifted a computer. Uh, by the age of 
10, 11, I had already started like playing games. Uh, in fact, one of the first games I played, most people don't know th- about this game, but it's a game called Mugen, right? Where you could create your own character. So you could have Superman play against Pikachu and Flash play against, I don't know, uh, Iron Man, right? So it's like crazy. And the game allowed you to also uh, write in your own character. So you can code the characters in and you can also sort of change the sprites, right? So I had to do a little bit of design on changing the sprites and I had to do a little bit of code as well. So I made my brother as a character in the game, I remember. And uh, age of 13, I fully started coding. Um, I, I used this programming language called Delphi. Most people don't know, don't remember Delphi, but it's a like, very old programming language back then. Um, Delphi, I think now is dead. So I started coding at the age of 13. Uh, by 16, 17, you know, I was sort of proficient. Uh, and, you know, when I went to college, I think in the first year, I, I went, to, I, I studied computer science, right, in Manipal, and <clears throat> in MIT. And in first year, I just decided, hey, this is not my cup of tea, right? I don't want to sit in class and like listen to teachers and whatever. So first year, I went to this person called, this friend of mine called Abhinav Chikara, who ended up becoming the head of design of an academy, right? And uh, this other guy called Karthik and so a bunch of people. We, we got together and we decided, hey, let's start a company. We had no idea what company we wanted to run. So first ever company we ran was a t-shirt company, right? And we said, we'll, we'll print, we'll put designs at the back of t-shirts, personalize them and give them to classes. And we sold like 500 t-shirts or something, right? So we did reasonably well, but t-shirts were too high effort and too low reward, right? And I felt like one of those... Banya type people who was just running around with a t-shirt every time there was a fest saying isko karido, isko karido. So I didn't want to do that, right? So what ended up happening was my mom actually sent me a link to this platform called Odesk. Uh, today it's called Upwork, but you know back then it's called Odesk, it's a freelancing platform. She said, you know how to code, right? So why don't you code on this platform? Maybe you can make some money. So I signed up and in fact, one of my first projects on Odesk was for a Malaysian eye clinic, three month long. It took me three months to finish the project. And I was also a noob, right? So I said, I'm not very good at this. Please give me a chance. That's my cover letter. And uh, I got paid $100. And my friends made fun of me. They're like, oh, $100 is nothing. Right? What was $100? And that time, $100 is 6,000 rupees. Today, it's like 7,000. Which year are you talking about? This is 2014, 2013, 2014, something like that. Right? So very, very young. Second year of Manipal? Yeah, second year of uh, of college was when I started freelancing. And... uh, as luck would have it, when you're a decent coder sitting in India and you can also do a little bit of design, um, you you end up, you know, you end up getting a lot of projects because you're, you're the cheapest on the market, right? But slowly we started increasing our like take rate. I mean, how much we charge, we started increasing. Our brand started increasing, right? right? Because on Odesk or uh, Upwork, your, your portfolio starts showing up. So, you know, everyone gives you ratings and so on and so forth. So we were doing reasonably well. I think in the fourth year, I was billing $150 an hour. Abhinav Chikara was also billing $150 an hour. We weren't technically working together at this point. We were all working in the same room, but separate projects, right? So one of the things I really, really respect and like thank myself for doing in college was freelancing. Because now that I can freelance, right, I always knew I can come back to this. And I have gone back to it many times in life, right? Because like worst case scenario, what's going to happen? If I fail, I'm going to go freelance. I'm going to make $150 an hour. That's not a bad life, right? And uh, the way, and and it also ties into why I started building distribution later in life, right? I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. But the idea was I can build anything. And I can build this for other people and other people want things built and they're willing to pay for it. But I think fourth year of college, um, you know, the entrepreneurship bug sort of bit me, right? And it's very different. They're similar in some ways, but they're also different in some ways to to freelance and then be an uh, entrepreneur, right? Because freelancing, you're not taking the risk. It's like you're using your skills, but you're not taking the emotional ups and downs of running a company, right? Or you're basically responsible for the outcome of a company when you become an entrepreneur. So uh, I decided to, you know, uh, start a company. It was called Jobspire. We basically wanted to build Nokri, but we wanted to build a very visual version of Nokri. Like, hey, if Zomato can do certain things for menu scanning, we can do certain things for, you know, job scanning in, in a way, right? Uh, so we wanted to show people what the people that work like, worked in a company, the the uh, the, the way the, uh, the office of a company looked. So you could like, it's like sort of window shopping and then decide which company yeah. you join. So fourth year, we started building that. And uh, I, I mean, you asked me a question of what my insight was, right? In, in that company, to be honest, I had zero insight. I was so young and it was just... I, for me, it still felt like a college project. 
Yeah. Right? The fourth year when I was doing this, right? Because it didn't feel like an actual company. Today, it feels very different to run Avalon compared to back then, right? So, uh, we we uh, we scaled to about 150k um, applicants. We had more than 4 million requests in 2016. We worked with 1,500 recruiters, including Uber and Swiggy. We were doing like 100k revenue. It's not great, but like it's whatever, yeah. right? It was very. I was super young. Um, and I think early 2017, we sold it to a New York based company for uh, called turn to tech. We sold it for single digit millions. It wasn't a great venture scale exit. No venture investor would be happy with that exit, but I was super young. Right. And for me, it was like, you know, it's like, Hey, at least I, I finished one circuit right now. I'm ready to do it. Back then, when you I, was, the- I was 22, 22, 22 and a half. Right. So for me, it was like big. Um, the one thing I wasn't happy with though, I mean, turn to was a New York based company. One thing I wasn't happy with is that they, they put us on a four year resting schedule, right? Yeah. I hated it. I hated every minute of it, right? I like the company. I like the founders, but I really hated vesting, right? I was like, I don't want to work for somebody else. Mm-hmm. So I think in the, uh, a, a year after that, like when, when I was working for them and again, I was doing core engineering, right? I was writing mm-hmm. code. I was doing front end for them. So I was like, uh, you know, I, I don't know why I just went out on YouTube and started putting out content, right? So I was like, I'm going to talk about term sheets. I'm going to talk about how to sell your company. How do you, uh, you know, how do you talk to investors? What's the difference between a seed round and a series A and whatnot, right? So I started putting out tactical content on YouTube, which at that point didn't exist. And the reason I put this out was because me and Abhinav, because we had done that freelancing journey, Bloomsbury, which is the book, the the publisher that published Harry Potter, they had come to us and they said, hey, write a book on your freelance career, right? For the, some reason, they were more interested in freelancing than the entrepreneurship part because they felt it was time for freelance in India and whatnot. And the book we wrote was called Pajama Profit. And the book lit, the, the book literally means pajamas, like, you know, yeah. pajamas and sitting at home and making money, right? Uh, it was a very cliche title in a, in a sense, but we kind of predicted remote work at that time. Nobody took remote work seriously back then. This was like 2017 or something like that, right? Um, But we were quite bullish on remote work. We were like, look, anything that is tech enabled can be done from home as long as you have the right process. And we had done freelance enough, worked with enough teams on Slack to know exactly what the process is like. Because if you're hiring engineers from India, you better have a process, right? Because otherwise they're going to just keep wasting your time. Uh, And I was very young, so I'd be very good at wasting people's time. So being on a clock sitting on Slack, those things were important, right? And they're things we use today as well. Obviously not the clock, but, you know, some of the processes, what I learned from the freelancing days, I still use today. Um, Then, um, you know, I think after Bloomsbury published the book, the book did really well. It became a number one uh, Amazon bestseller, right? But Bloomsbury, in order to promote the book, they asked us to go and put out some content on YouTube. So we started putting out some content on YouTube for that reason. And uh, that did well, right? Because I was putting out tactical content in a world where all the business gurus were putting out content about, you know, 21 din mein paisa double. Right? So it's like, it's like the first uh, signal in the world of noise, right? Yeah. Um, so I was pr- incredibly proud of it. There was a small audience that started forming around it. And I said, hey, you know, for the first time ever, right? I was like, I, I, I now have some feedback, because in Jobsfire, we never had feedback, right? Like, it's a very one-time use thing. It's like Jobsfire had high DAO, but if you looked at the cohorts analysis, the retention was very poor. Yeah. Because what's the, like, you'll come to a recruitment platform, you'll use it once and then you'll leave, right? Like, there's no reason for you to come again. So, uh, because our, uh, my, my uh, uh, YouTube audience would tell me things, right? I finally started understanding what India is like. Right. In fact, that's what I thank for YouTube. Right. It's never happened to me on Twitter. It's happened to me on yeah. YouTube. But on Twitter, it's like the same problems that like English school educated engineering boy. That's Twitter. Yeah. Right. Maybe slightly more woke. Right. But YouTube is very different. YouTube is India. Right. It has the entire spectrum of India from people who don't make any money to people who cannot speak English to people who are super affluent looking for, you know, how do I change my tap? Right. So it's like a very diverse audience and I got to learn a lot from them, right? Um, and that's what I thank YouTube for. And I think a year after that, after I started doing YouTube and we were at like 50K, I moved to Instagram because Instagram is giving us some more organic headwind at that point. So uh, <clears throat> we got, I was at about 125K uh, audience on, on Instagram. At that point, I decided, um, you know, I'm going to start a services company. Like I'm going to quit this this company. And I didn't have a like a fantastic idea on what to build yet. Uh, and I didn't want to take 
you know, I, I wanted to build some more bank in a way, right? Yeah. So we started an agency. We started an agency called uh, Avalon, uh, where we said, hey, we will just work for companies for a while, build some bank, and then build a product, right? Like every agency person's dream. The problem with that is you sort of get sucked into the agency in itself, right? Because we had scaled to 50 employees. We had lots of engineers, and we had lots of... Uh, uh, you know, marketing personnel. So some of the clients we worked for were, were MongoDB. We worked with um, um, Fireside Ventures. We worked with Kapiva in India, right? So lots of, we worked with, um, there was an Itochu funded company we worked with, Dockety, right? So plenty of companies we worked with and you sort of get sucked into th- the middle of things, right? But to be very honest, after maybe the first six months when we were hustling, getting the agency live, I think I really hated the process of running an agency. I'll tell you why, right? Talent will come to you and ask you, what is my long-term plan here? What am I doing here? And I wouldn't have an answer. Right? I'm like, as I didn't have the heart to tell somebody, well, as long as the client exists, you exist here. Right? Whereas it's very different today at Avalon where, you know, everyone knows that there's a long-term goal. Everyone yeah. knows there's some, some, something we're working towards. Right? And that's when I saw somebody's, I don't remember, some slide deck by somebody I saw where he said that it's easier to build a Google than it is to build an agency because if you say that, okay, your long-term goal is to build, let's say, uh, artificial general intelligence, right? You are more likely to pick up smart talent that wants to work with you, right? And who will stick with you over the long term. Whereas if you say you're building an agency, people will stick for six months and then leave. Right. So, and again, we had crazy attrition problems at Avalon and I, you know, it, it wasn't the greatest place to be. Right. So I wanted to build a product. I wanted to like sort of galvanize everything. And, uh, you know, because we had an audience the, the you know, we said, let's, let's first build a community. Right. It was just a thing we wanted to do, but we wanted to build a community. So we still hadn't gone to the product phase yet. And we built a community. We built, in fact, one of India's largest youth communities on Discord. We had 68% month six retention. It was a crazy retention that we had. And, um, you know, very, very loyal audience. So it is the audience we had on YouTube, me, Shashank, my co-founder, and Abhinav, my co-founder, we just moved our audiences to Discord. We're like 50K people-ish. And um, it was good. And we started monetizing that audience. We knew there was a business here. Uh, but I wanted to build a platform, right? I didn't want to do everything on Discord because tomorrow Discord can, you know, pull the rug and then you'd be gone, right? In fact, that's sort of happened on Discord today because now people have started, especially the NFT wave, people have started joining many servers. And when they join many servers, they forget about the old ones, right? Mm-hmm. When is the last time you clicked on an old Discord server? It doesn't happen. And the way Discord notifications work, if you start getting notifications from Discord, uh, for a server, it lasts five minutes. After that, it stops. You don't get notifications from a Discord server unless it's below 20 people. We didn't know this, right? So we thought, hey, Discord is going to be forever. But actually, we knew it. So that's why I wanted to like get off of Discord. So we moved to... Um, um, so so we wanted to move and we started building a platform of our own, right? So first, we built a platform saying that everyone can be on the same platform. Then we realized yeah. that actually people, you know, if we wanted to scale this beyond like 50K, 100K, right? And prevent the noise, we need to have other creators come in or other uh, entrepreneur or businesses come in and kind of create their own communities. So that's how we built scenes. Uh, we raised some money from it. We raised about 1.1 million, 1.5 million at that time, right? So we raised, so we did like two rounds, one a small round with uh, Peer Place, uh, this Canadian company and, and a little bit from Purvi Capital. And then second round, we raised from Better Labs, from iSeed, from uh, Kunal Shah, from, you know, a bunch of influencers, um, lots of investors, Whiteboard Capital, uh, Tanglin. Yeah. Right. So a bunch of investors we brought, brought together and we said, hey, the goal is to build like the ultimate community platform. Most of them knew that we were in the community space. Right. And most of them respected us in the community space. So they said, hey, you know, here's some money. Go, go, go figure it out. And I went out, hired some really good talent, very differently from the way we did Avalon 1.0. So very small team, very focused objective. Um, even now, you know, we, the core team is maybe like just 15 people. Right. Okay. Very, very focused objective. Hey, we're going to build this. And we're going to, this is our TG and this is who we think, like, we just want to target more people like us, but we didn't want to target them in India. We wanted to go to the US and target them, right? Because I don't think in India, there's a big market. We actually ran an experiment in India. It didn't work so well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's how scenes came to be. I think today we're a community platform. We're, we're doing fairly well, top quartile performance for SaaS. Uh, we just need to keep doing more of it, I guess. And and can you share your some of the numbers on scene? Like, where would you be in terms of your ARR? Uh, the number of clients who would be your top uh, clients and why they why do they use scenes yeah so some of our top clients are uh, gg nation they just raised like three mil or something like that we have growth school who's using scenes uh, we now have um, 
uh, companies in the US like Wings of the World. We have companies in the U in Canada like one of our investors, Pure Plays, who uh, kind of jumped on scenes. We're at about 400k revenue. We're adding about 30 to 100k of new revenue every month. Right. In fact, by the end of next month, we're expecting to be at around 600-ish k. Right. With just in in terms of pipeline, uh, growing pretty fast. Uh, every month, it's like very consistent. Sales team, the report, I can sort of predict it. Right. Looking like yeah. at the start of the month, they predict. I mean, they tell me what the pipeline is. End of the month, they close, and it's like such a predictable number. Right. We even know the conversion percentage. Uh, it's a very CAC-driven business. So you spend money, and then we get a customer, and then you know, whatever they go through the motions. We have a sales motion after uh, the customer discovers us. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we're doing very well. Why do they use us? Two reasons, right? I think we have two very specific ICPs, the, uh, like personas. The first persona is like creators. Uh, these are people like Ankur Variku, for example, Ankur Variku uses scenes, Financial Sharon uses scenes. Um, for them, it's same problem that I had, right? We have an audience on YouTube. We want to own that audience, right? For once we want to own the, the, the distribution that we have, otherwise you don't own it, right? It's just, you're renting it from YouTube or yeah. Instagram or whatever. So very, very obvious use case for them. And eventually they'll monetize with courses, right? And scenes has the infra to, to, to do courses as well. Um, and on the other hand, I think if you, if you look at, um, uh, businesses, right. For example, now we're doing uh, a pilot with monster jobs, right. Where you, they just went live yesterday. And if you look at them, for them, it's like, we have high DAO. We want to convert that into retention, right? And for some uh, businesses, it could be GTM, right? Like it could be, hey, we just want to have, like this is one company called Nova HQ that uses us, where they just want to have people engaging and then they'll find a way to monetize it. They're very similar to how we did it, right? On our Discord. So very, three different use cases, I would say three, like two different personas, but three different use cases. And every day, the, the fact that scenes is so complex and vast, you can even do things like custom CSS, right? you can make it look like your own platform. Because it's so vast, you can use scenes in any, any way, right? So every day we get surprised with new use cases where we didn't predict it, right? It just came on the platform by itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're growing pretty fast. And right now, it's like, if we spend X, we know we can make Y, right? So it's now a question of, how much X to spend and should we raise money for it? And those sort of second order questions, I guess. Dear listeners, before we dive further into the podcast, I would like to welcome Prashant Kanti, Head of Product Management at Zoho Payroll and Zoho Books. Prashant, what is your long-term vision for Zoho Payroll? Thanks, Siddharth. So for, for us, right, at Zoho, uh, everything we invest for the long term, uh, that includes Zoho Payroll. We will continue to invest uh, in R and D, uh, uh, push innovations in the payroll domain, and what we are, we will also do is payroll straddles both HR and finance. And uh, many times, what we uh, we see many of these problems as situated applications like payroll or something that just addresses one domain. What we have observed is all these applications have wide implications. All these departments like payroll have wide implications across the organization. So we will continue to ensure that the data residing in payroll applications disseminate across the organization and help with decision making across various departments. Um, furthermore, we are emerging as a payroll platform. Uh, we, we, we encourage our customers to solve problems that we ourselves have not imagined. Um, and uh, we are also seeing if uh, uh, payroll uh, pay plays a larger role in the ecosystem. Like, for example, payroll, uh, we connect with banks. Uh, going forward, we might talk to insurance providers, uh, with uh, the regulatory authorities. So end-to-end -end automation across the entire ecosystem. So that's our long-term plan for payroll. Thank you, Prashant. Dear listeners, you will find more about Zoho Payroll in the show notes. Now, let's further continue with the podcast. Got it. And what is the, the one thing that excites you most about scenes yeah. that didn't excite you in your previous entrepreneurship stint? Well, I think um, <clears throat> the problem with the word excitement is I think that eventually you run out of excitement for everything. Right. If if you run a SaaS company for too long, if you run a SaaS company for ten, you can go talk to any SaaS founder who's at his tenth year, right? Unless something exciting has been happening in the other parts of the business, unless maybe you went IPO or whatever, yeah. they're all going to say the same thing, right? And you've worked in SaaS for so long, you know what they're going to say, right? They're going to be like, "I'm bored." It's more of the same, 
right? I think lots of people, especially people like me, really enjoy the zero to one, right? And the one to n is like is sort of boring, yeah. right? Um, so for me, I don't know it's, uh, if it's about excitement. It's for me, it's about solving a problem I had, right? We wanted to run a community. One day, I plan to run my own community on scenes. That's it, right? And I want to build the ultimate product before that. So technically, I'm building the ultimate product for myself as an individual, right? And scenes happens to be that product, and lots of other people happen to have that problem. So it's a very, I have a problem sort of thing, right? So it's less about excitement. That's the difference between now and with Jobspy, right? With Jobspy, I never, even though I was in the placement age, right? I never had the challenge of, I want to get a job, right? So I didn't yes. know, I didn't know the core motivations. I mean, I could guess what the core motivations are. Okay, people want a job, maybe, you know, they, to, f, f, to make money, to to afford a better lifestyle, to get married, like lots of, you know, bunch of different motivations, but I didn't feel them, right? And if you don't feel the motivations yourself, you probably don't know what to build, right? You're probably building haphazardly. And one of the things we've done at Avalon, uh, <clears throat> now I've told you a story, but it's been a very muddled story. Muddled in the sense we've been through a lot of pivots, right? We've, first, we've said community platforms should, should be owned completely by us. Then we said, no, 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 community platforms should be owned by the creators and we'll do a take rate. Then we realized, okay, fuck, even creators want SaaS, right? Yeah. Even Anandpur Variku, when we were consumer social, didn't want to use our platform. He said no to me so many times. And then the minute we turned SaaS, he was like, I'll, I'll buy now, right? So it's... Um, we went through two, three pivots, right? And I feel like when you're very excited about an idea, you hold on very dearly to it. But when you're excited about a problem, you don't care about looking like a fool in the short term, right? You only care about building the best platform, right? And I think we've been through two, three pivots to get there. And I feel if I was too attached or excited to something, I, I, I wouldn't have gotten here, right? And also I've learned a lot of things along the way, I guess. But, but there's a difference between, you know, solving a problem really well and building a large business so which part do you care more about yeah i i and and i know i shouldn't be saying this on a on a podcast listened to by vcs but i just really want to solve the problem and i feel like at the end of the day right it's always about the best product the best product wins right i understand i, I know the vcs have this question about gtm or you know how are you going to capture n number of customers how are you going to win the market and whatnot right i feel like those are lesser smaller challenges for us and it's something I don't say often, so because I know it for granted and a lot of VCs don't. But it's like for us, the minute I know there's a product that people love and people really want, I will get the distribution, right? It's like distribution is our bread and butter, right? We, we are the only founders to apply a consumer social DNA to SaaS. In fact, you could argue that the end user of our product is still a consumer, right? It's still an end user, right? Like It's like WhatsApp. You build, I mean, not WhatsApp. WhatsApp is the wrong example, but uh, here... I guess the end user, maybe who's a chat uh, chat channel on scenes or the forum channel on scenes, is still a consumer. Is still the kind of co you know consumer we create for on YouTube in a way, right? So, <clears throat> I really uh, <clears throat> I, I want to solve my own problems, and I feel like if you solve your own problems and you do it really, really, really well, you come up with a best, really good product. And then what do you need to do? You need to take that core that that really, really good product and advertise and market it very, very well, right? In a very creative way. And I feel like that left brain, right brain balance, I had to learn all the way if, if you've, you know, since the age of 11 or 12, when I used to use that game engine, when I started making characters on the game engine, I had to use both uh, the sprites as well as the code, right? So I had to anyway do the left brain, right brain juggle then, right? So I feel like for us, the struggle has only been to build a great product that people want. Rest, GTM is like not our problem. I know it's a problem for a lot of other Indian companies. It's not a problem for us. And what was your... Uh end goal right do you want it to see with 1 million creators or businesses uh, in the world yeah i think this is a long term bet right like if you look at 10 years ago you had geo cities you're, you're familiar with geo cities yahoo yeah. geo cities everyone used to tell me that don't buy a domain just build your website on geo cities yeah. and their reasoning was this geo cities has trust so everything is going to be housed under that trust what ended up happening what ended up happening is everyone ended up using domains. Yeah. Right? Now, the thing about Scenes is, Scenes is the ultimate community platform. We have the we have the most comprehensive community platform on the planet, bar none, right? You can take all the other community platforms. We like The reason we're stealing customers from them is because we have that feature set. Uh, and we really focus on that feature set, right? In our platform, you can also spin out custom mobile apps. Okay, so a lot of people ask us today, why do people need custom mobile apps? And I keep telling them, right? If you're an educator, 
or if you're in the ed tech space, which is most of our clientele, right? You will eventually want to transition into a custom mobile app. You'll want to own your cohorts, right? It ends up happening, right? And even if you don't, if, you, if you're charging money from somebody, they keep coming back to the platform, right? To For your lessons or whatever. So my personal belief is in the long term, just like GeoCities and Domains, Domains ended up, GoDaddy ended up winning. I feel yeah. like we will end up winning because we are the white labeled version or the SaaS version of, let's say, uh, platforms that exist today, a Maven or a, you know, an academy in a sense, right? So with the antithesis of that, right? And I feel one company that's done that reasonably well is Class Plus, right? Where they've actually spun and, and teach right? Where they've spun out custom apps for creators and uh, teachers and those teachers run their business on that app, right? Since it's like version two of that, right? A very international version of that because Class Plus is not suited for the international world, right? For example, a lot of the international teachers will want their uh, audience to be on HubSpot, They'll want, uh, you know, some CRM integration, right? They'll yeah. want, they'll want it to be on Zapier, right? Which ClassPlus doesn't solve, right? ClassPlus is different TG. So I feel like ClassPlus for the US, but, you know, we can handle communities as well, right? It's not just courses. It's also communities that we handle. I feel like long term, everyone will have an app. You'll, instead of you spending 3 lakhs, 5 lakhs a month on a developer, buy scenes, right? It costs you $300 a month. And even you as a, as a creator, right? Because technically on this podcast, you become a creator, Eventually, yeah. when you want to own your audience, when you want to have that private group of 100 founders for your own deal flow, that could be a very selfish mm-hmm. need, right? I want deal flow. And for the founders, like I want to be connected to other founders, where are you going to do it? You can't do it on you can't do it on Zencast. You can't do it on YouTube, right? You have to choose a platform. And the best platform that will come to your head is Scenes because you'll be like, even though you might not want a custom mobile app now, you'll be like, if I get larger and I want to evolve into a business, Scenes is there for me throughout my journey. In fact, we now also have an API we're releasing SDK soon. So even if you expand beyond us, you become a fitter. Let's say you use scenes and you become fitter and you're making 100 crores a year. You can still use our SDKs and evolve beyond us, right? So the entire roadmap I've sort of built out for people. And um, I want to do it very differently from the way most other Indian businesses do it. Most Indian businesses do it in a very cumbersome way, right? They're like if you look at most of successful businesses, let's take EdTech for a second, right? Yeah. Every company will have like a thousand employees. They'll have like 50 people running after creators. They'll have hundred people, you know, <clears throat> doing some rubbish in the company. For us, it's like, I want to be a very small team. It's a product we're selling. We sell a product, right? We don't sell anything beyond that product. We have ecosystems built around it. Like you want a community manager. We have an ecosystem of community managers who we train ourselves and we got sort of plates in your company, right? If, if you want them. Uh, and then obviously we have sales machinery and stuff. That's always going to be human. Uh, but it's like, it's done very differently, right? So I can run the business. The revenue per employee is going to be super high, right? And I don't understand because I've been an engineer for like almost like very long time, almost 16 years, right? And uh, I just feel like, Anyone who hires like 100 engineers for like a super tiny product, I don't know what they're doing, right? And maybe I don't, like maybe that's a lack of experience on my part. But for us now, we want to be a small team and, and, and build very focused product and just get advertising eyeballs basically on the product, right? Which we, we know how to do well. And, and you believe that, you know, scenes can eventually replace Discord? I don't think so. I think, uh, and this is something people get wrong about Discord, right? Discord is a huge engagement, but most of their engagement is communities or groups with under 10 people yeah 10 to 20 people right it's like i want to game with my five friends i want to play uh fifa with my five friends or i want to play some i don't know valorant with my five friends i jump on a discord server. that's most of their engagement by the way in fact discord's revenue comes from nitro 100 million they make per year from from the nitro subscription right nitro is not it's like a very weird offering right it's like a very ambiguous offering and the bet from all the vcs is that hey we've invested in discord you guys will figure it out. I valued at $7 billion on a, you will figure it out sort of thesis, right? Uh, we are very different. We are SaaS, where you pay us money, you're using this product for something, some of you will churn. On Discord, there's very low churn because, I mean, there's yeah, churn yeah. as in user, there's user churn. People just stop using the platform. But here, we will also have revenue churn, right? Uh, <clears throat> so very different. We are for larger communities than Discord or WhatsApp. The ideal size is 250 plus. If you have a community of 250 plus, scenes is the best option for you. Right below 250, even we recommend go use WhatsApp. Right, the last kind of community we don't go after is uh, <clears throat> dev communities. We prefer we we actually tell them go to GitHub discussions. Yeah. Right, that's the better place for you to do this. Um, yeah, that's it. Every other community, you know, we sort of handle with our initial kind of injection point is um, educators, anyone who's teaching, because we find those communities have highest retention. 
Sohan, uh, with scenes having such a large potential, why do you continue to be a creator, right? Isn't uh, that a distraction for you or? Uh... So, uh, two reasons, right? First reason is, I feel like, and this is something I learned from Nas Daily, right? Uh, I, I went to Dubai, he housed me in, in his place and uh, we were just talking about being an entrepreneur. So he, he's raised like 20 million or something like that, right? Yeah. Still continues to be a creator. I asked him why. He's like, first meeting with anybody is on the NAS brand. That's it. Like first meeting with anybody is on the NAS brand. So if you have a large brand, a personal brand, people will take a meeting with you. Yeah. It's just a guarantee, right? And believe it or not, I have, uh, I've had interactions with people like Jason Kalakness. I've had interactions with people like, in fact, <clears throat> a lot of VCs who even discovered me first, discovered me through uh, Twitter. In fact, my entire last round happened because Gaurav saw one of my tweets on Twitter, called me, I mean, sent me a text and said, come to my office. He would never have discovered me if I had cold emailed. Right. So it's like a lot of founders do a lot of push, yeah. right? Where they are pushing and saying, please take my meeting. But the problem with push is, imagine if you get a cold email from someone, right? Versus you learning about someone organically. You are more high intent if you learn about someone organically, right? So I feel like I don't have to push anymore, right? First meeting is always on the house. Like Avalon people will take a meeting, whether you're a yeah. creator, right? Like the last, we've closed like five very big creators. In fact, the total size of the audience of the creators we've closed just in the last one month has been like five mil plus. Right. The only reason they've taken meeting is because they know who Avalon is. They know who the, they know who I am. Right. And they respect me as a creator. So even if you're an entrepreneur, you might not take a meeting with me, the entrepreneur, you might take a meeting with me, the creator. If you're a creator, you might not take a meeting with me, the creator might take the meeting with me, the entrepreneur. Yeah. Right? So it's like a double hat thing. And also I feel like uh, a lot of people who see me uh, as a creator do not understand how little time it takes. Right. First year, it took me a lot of time. Because I was truly sitting, doing research about topics and like putting out content, right? Today, it's like I sprint for five days and then content just gets produced. And Twitter is different, right? My, my process on Twitter is I just spitball. I'm just like, I, I'm thinking this thought, let me just write it down. Like Kunal Shah, the way Kunal Shah does it, right? Um, obviously, granted, it, it also brings you like a bunch of haters. Um, yeah. they'll be like, I don't like your thoughts, right? In general, right? And it, it creates a very like... A lot of people become polarized. Some people really like you. Some people really hate you, right? Uh, that's a that's a this thing of content. But the truth is, it it opens every meeting, right? And right now, for scenes, we need the meetings. And one other thing, or two other things that I've learned from being a creator is, I learned who the audience is, right? I learned what they want, what their core motivations are. Like as a convent educated person, right? Like you always have this idea of what humans are, which is not true. It's like a very bookish version of what humans are. But when you see like hundreds of thousands of comments, you're like, oh, I get what you guys want. I understand, you know, your needs and, and ideas. So I feel like I lose that touch with reality if I if I stop being a creator, right? And I start making bullshit decisions, which are, it's not first principle decision making, right? It's not something that people want. It's just some random stuff, right? Where I've heard from somebody else. Like that's how my other founder friends make decisions where they'll be like, oh, I heard from this person. This is a good decision. So I'll make this decision. Yeah. Right. You have no real insight. Whereas I can do this right now, right? I can go to, and I've done this before as well. I can go to my Instagram. I can put up a story saying, Hey guys, would you like A or B? Or do you prefer A or B? And I have like, I can have like 20,000 people replying to that poll. That is like larger sample size than uh, obviously biased sample size because this smartest audience in India, um, <clears throat> which is what I pride myself on. But if you look at, uh, if you zoom in on uh, Accenture, even Accenture won't give you a survey with that many results. Yeah, uh, Accenture is the brand that does surveys, right? If, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there are many. <laughs> yeah, like Deloitte. I mean, Deloitte I know is different, but <clears throat> basically I get, I know that the smartest audience, I can just ask them what, what will you pay for? And yeah. I get the answers from that, right? So I feel like my quality of ideas gets sharpened. And I feel like as a CEO, one thing that <clears throat> most important thing that content has done for me is I can put a swipe up and I can have 100 engineers applying for the company tomorrow. Every single person we have hired, except like one or two people who we've hired from agencies, every other person we've hired from Twitter. I hired the first employee of Native Base, right? One of the most popular GitHub um, projects through Twitter. I just put up a tweet saying we're hiring a senior React Native engineer. I had him uh, apply, right? Uh, we hired senior guys from Unacademy. We hired senior guys from Baiju's, all because 
I put up either tweets or like Instagram stories. So I feel it's like a great hiring tool. And one last thing is when you built a good team and, you know, they enjoy working here and whatnot, because, which is something I failed at in my last company, to be honest, right? I didn't build the best culture here. Like you learn from your mistakes. So yeah. you built a much better culture in the last one, one and a half years. Once you have that and once you have it on autopilot, I feel your job as a CEO is three things, right? Raise capital, communicate the internal story externally and get the external story, like tell the external story internally very well. And I feel like the last thing is... <clears throat> to make like two, three very high quality decisions a year, right? So I feel like all I have to do now at this point is to make two, three very high quality decisions and obviously continue to raise capital, right? And I feel like there are two ways to raise capital. One is to go tell an awesome story, yeah, which I can do, but like, you know, in our previous interaction before the podcast, I, I refuse to tell a lie, right? Yeah. I refuse to say that this is a bazillion dollar business when I'm not convinced, right? So that's one way. The other way is to say, hey, I'm convinced about, a to B, and I have a very clear idea of A to B. Um, this is what we're going, this is who we're going after. We know them very, very well. Here's the data, right? So I feel like when your business starts doing well and you, when your business starts making money, then you, uh, uh, you you don't need to fundraise the in a storytelling way, right? I think the VCs come to you. Like I said, push versus pull. So I feel like living a pull life is much better and creator allows me to, to live a pull life. Talent, investors, uh, telling the story internally, externally, the pull life is, it's, it's more convenient, I guess. Uh, the price of that is that I have to go, uh, you know, last week of December and go into sort of like a sannyasi mode and, and create content, like continuous. Uh, we have a studio where I just like, you know, I spitball for like hours and hours. My editors hate me for that. Uh, but yeah, that's a small price to pay, I guess. Got it. And uh, tell us more about your uh, learnings on YouTube or, and then again for Twitter in the last four years of creating content on it, what works, what not works. This is for the, the entrepreneurs and creators who aspire to build an audience like you. Uh, I'll be honest, right? Like, and I think a lot of Indian VCs are going through this because a lot of Indian VCs are now become creators in a, in a, in a yeah. traditional sense of things. Right. I feel like one thing that I didn't get back then, which they also don't get right now is that they create content with their self image in, in, in focus, which I did for years, right? I was like, this is me. This is who I am. This is what I talk about. And yeah, I can't, I have to hold this very close, right? For example, I will tweet about, uh, you know, five quick commerce trends and write a thread about it. Here's what I believe about quick commerce, write a thread about it. I feel like, um, that's good. It attracts you one kind of audience, but if you truly want to build a brand, you have to take a stand. Right. You have to stand for something. Right. And uh, YouTube really rewards people who are authentic, even Twitter, actually. Like if you're authentic, if you truly believe in what you're saying and people can see when you when you truly believe in what you're saying, right, you build a brand. And I feel like for me on YouTube, the first thing I learned was you can have two people, one with 100K followers, the other with 100K followers. People might take this person 10 times more seriously. And, you know, the person's conversions, the person's audience, everything could be much better here. And it could be much better here because that person has built a particular stand, brand and taken a stand, right? Whereas the other creator can just be writing threads about, basically, that's the difference between being a trend jacker versus being mm -hmm. a, uh, someone with long-term thinking, in a sense, right? And I always chose the idea of, I want to be a long-term thinker. Now, a little bit, I I'd sprinkle a little bit of trends in there uh, and try to, you know, tie it in the long term. And I'd... Like maybe in two years in the past, I would have spoken about coronavirus, right? I would have given my thoughts on coronavirus. I don't do that anymore. It's not my domain, right? And I want, I don't want people to get muddled and think of me as like a general purpose talks about everything sort of person, right? I want to be known for like just two, three things. And more importantly, I think on YouTube and, and Twitter, you need to entertain. Twitter less, but YouTube, you need to start entertaining, right? You need to edit well. Uh, and obviously I don't do my editing. I have a team that does editing. You need to edit well. You need to entertain. Do you know? You know, Harry Stebbings, right? I don't know if I'm pronouncing yeah. his name right, right? The the um, the guy who runs the, what's the name of the podcast? Two Minute VC. Yeah, Two, two Minute VC, right? So I don't know if you've seen, and I have like a, you know, a, um, a VPN-based TikTok, right? Just for research. I hate yeah. the platform, but just for research. I followed them on uh, TikTok. The kind of content they do for any VC in India to do it, I would be very surprised if a VC in India does it. Like funny content. Right, it's like one video where the guy is wearing a bald cap and running around and whatever. But apparently it brings them five to eight leads a day. Right? Which is crazy. Because 
at the end of the day the a founder is going to discover you through the things you say yeah right and things you do and the funnier you are the more relatable you are the more they want to work with you i'll give you my own example right there was once a vc like a tier 1 vc that was evaluating us we had got through the ic we, we, we didn't make it through the last round right because in the very ending they were still on the fence by the ending of it but uh, we were talking to multiple vcs at that time and i really wanted to work with this vc because the partner seemed chill he seemed super chill right he was just like i'm going to be there for you he's making cracking jokes with me on like zoom zoom call and what not right and i was like when you use tiktok or youtube or whatever you get to see that personality before you talk to the person yes yeah. right so that interaction i had over zoom now you can have with millions of people right and so when i hear your podcast right and i and i hear that you understand saas very well and you've spoken 10 times about how do you get from 1 mil to 10 mil arr that is super valuable for me right so i would love to like work with you versus another vc who's writing threads about quick commerce right so it's it, like i said you have to take a stand you have to be and, and that also means alienating some people right if you talk too much about saas the consumer social guys are going to be like hey you know i don't want to work with you because you're a saas guy which is okay there's there's no i mean like i said right like it's the trade offs but there's always uh, something you know you can't have please everyone in the market yeah and i think once you start with your stand right and you understand that you need to entertain i think these are two important things right you start with the mm-hmm. stand you need to entertain then your content flows through then you be like when you're jotting down an idea like am i taking a stand in this idea like if i talk about some random stuff right like let's say or, or take an example of some of your best videos that performed right yeah yeah i can i can tell you that right one of the best videos that performed for me was leaving home right i'm yeah. very i'm very bullish on the fact that young kids 20 21 should leave home at least for 2 3 years yeah to become independent to become you know to learn about the world to understand what real problems are there in the world and then come back right so i feel like um, that was me taking a stand and i got like half the videos in fact i had first put out a tweet about that that uh, topic right and the tweet got like 7 8000 likes and there was an article on story pick about that tweet where lots of people in the tweet were saying bad things 7000 likes but lots of people were saying bad things that yeah. oh whatever you can do outside you can do at home which is fundamentally not true right you cannot do at home what you would do if you went out for one or two years if you lived with your own roommates and you had those fights and you, know, you left the geezer on and the roommate was shouted at you and you know you were sick and nobody is there to clean the plates when you're sick and you know your parents are not going to be there right because if yeah. you're sick at home your parents are going to eventually go clean the plates but if you're alone and you have nobody to help you your parents are not going to come and like magically teleport there right they're going to have to um, they're going to have to do it for you so yeah. uh, i mean you're going to have to do it for yourself so i was very bullish about that that's me taking a stand and that's also me understanding that um, or, or rather you know making it a little bit entertaining so the video is a little bit entertaining right i'm not going to just boringly say leave your home i'm going to make it fun i'm going to draw parallels and stuff like that and uh, that has come naturally to me like that's the part that people underestimate right when you've been a creator for 4 years it doesn't take the kind of effort that it takes in year 1 but by year 4 you know what the audience wants to hear you know what you stand for and you also know how to make it entertaining right it's naturally when you speak you will speak in an entertaining high retention fashion what i mean by high retention is you'll make sure nobody drops off you make sure okay yeah. i'm starting to say boring things let me let me switch topic right uh, last thing is i also feel and uh, this is something that i've started thinking about in the last one or two years right there's a very pareto principle that applies on twitter you could have one really good video that booms that does super duper well right and you could have 30 terrible videos which do nothing for you so you need to look for the hits and the way to look for the hits is a very vc style approach of doing things tam leave home leave your home please leave your home is a super high tam video yeah. right there's another video i did which which did very very well called uh, three incredible tips to improve english and nobody would expect me to do, to do this topic in year 1 but year 4 i did it right and the reason i did it was because i'm like i stand for this i i stand for the ability to learn communication skills especially in english because i think that that's the language of opportunity but more importantly i feel like the tam for this for people who want to improve their english skills is super high right so there's a third thing so three things right first is you need to make sure that you stand for something you need to be entertaining and then you need to have super high tam follow these three things then write down 10 ideas that belong to these three things because once you have these three things no writing ideas very easy super easy right it's like you can sit down and like in a day you can have like 50 ideas right and then 
you maybe you spend another two days just jotting down one to two bullet points for each. You don't need to make long videos, right? Three to four minutes is enough. Jot down bullet points, then go to the studio for you know two three days, wrap everything. Like just literally have to be exhausted by the end of it. It needs to feel like a shoot, and then you're done. Then you just give it to the editors. And in fact, ninety percent of my views come from short content, which I haven't explicitly shot. It's just my old videos, which my editors go and like clip. Yeah. Right. So in fact. Like ninety percent of the content that you'll see on sh- short content that you see on my YouTube is all content that I've made at least three years in the past, right? So that's a form. That's my formula, uh, in in a way. Um, and obviously, you know, there's 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 some data science around it as well. I think YouTube cares about three things mainly. First thing is it cares about the average view duration, yeah. right? YouTube wants to make sure that you're spending as much time on videos as possible because it doesn't want you to click out, right? The more time you spend mm-hmm. on the video, the more you know your the more money they make, right? So they want you to spend as much time. Second thing is CTR. So when you do thumbnails, it has to be crazy thumbnails, right? Uh, like I said, that's the problem with me three years ago, where I wouldn't make a funny face because I'd be like, if I make a funny face, all people think of me. Yeah. Today I'm like, I will go. I will go to the studio. I'll make ten funny faces, and I'll be like, kuch karo. Use AI. Worst case, I'm not yeah. going to shoot it again, right? Um, and uh, so you do CTR. So your thumbnail has to be good. The title has to be slightly clickbaity, right? Because if it's not clickbaity, it doesn't work. And so most of the time these days, if you look at YouTubers, the title and their content doesn't make any sense, right? It's just title is there to get you to click and content is something else entirely, which is fine actually on YouTube. As long as you deliver, the, the content delivers in some way, it's fine. And then finally, I think um, uh, it's it's also about the topic in itself, right? Like some things people just don't care about. I've tried this type of video three times. I've tried a video about hunger. Like there's this thing about hunger in India, right? Where hunger in India, like India is now producing like 300 and something million tons of food. And we need 250 million tons to be food secure. So India is already food secure. Yeah. The reason like a big chunk of India is still hungry is because of poor infrastructure. We're not able to get food to the right people. It's a good topic, right? I personally believe it's an important topic. But nobody cares about it. Every time I do a video about it, and I've done a video about it thrice because I'm like, will it change yeah. this time? I've tried different thumbnails, like the craziest thumbnails, the best, you know, entertaining content. It always pulls like 5, 10K views. That's it. People just don't seem to care about it, right? And even though this, theoretically, the TAM seems to be high. So sometimes YouTube, like, confuses me also. But when you've done three, four years of this and you've seen this back to back to back, you have a keen sense of what people like. Right. And when you have a keen sense of what people like, you can build for those people. Right. And like I said, the end consumer of our product is still a consumer. Right. They, they have the same needs, same boredom, same motivation, same everything. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's like it, it takes me far lesser time uh, than most people imagine. And I think the ROI for me has been really good, especially with like opening meetings or like just understanding what people do and, and make and, and hiring in general. And, and it's the same process you applied for Twitter also, like Twitter is different. Twitter is like, if something comes to my head, I just type it. I just have like a t- Twitter open in front of my this thing. I write one tweet to two tweets a day. Some de- sometimes okay. I don't write also, right? I just go and I type whatever. I'll give you an example of Twitter being done right, okay? Yeah. If I were to choose to raise money from an investor, early stage, okay? If I were to do it again, I would choose Web of Domkundur. And okay. I will tell you why. Because I've seen so many tweets from Web of Domkundur appear on my global feed without yeah. me following him. Now I follow him, but back then I didn't follow him. I've seen so many tweets of his insight. Like I said, taking a stand, right? Of his insight. Yeah. And the stand he's taken now is, hey, business have to be profitable, blah, 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 blah. Which is good, right? I, I don't know if you had the same stand two years ago, but when I see that, I'm like, I have affinity towards this person. Yeah. After three, four months of seeing his tweets, I'm like, I know this guy. I trust this guy. That's it. Right, we live in a trust deficient economy. Right, when you choose a community platform tomorrow, you are going to see five options, and then you're going to be like, This one option, I know the founder, he's Elon Musk, right, or whatever, yeah. whoever the founder is. I know him very, very well. They might not spend on marketing, but I know the founder, I trust him, right. And I've seen this founder appear with God knows, uh, Jackie Shroff, whatever, yeah. right? because our brains are very associative in that sense, right? You see a person with some big person with Modi or whatever, suddenly in your head, even if you hate the person, you're like, your status elevated plus five, right? And that status can also be transferred from person to product. That's one big learning for me, right? And that's something that we have seen that 
a lot of creators have seen with cred right you could be kunal shah and your thoughts your ideas especially if someone's watched an actual like 10 minute video of kunal shah even a 10 minute video they have that affinity towards him which he transfers to the product so even if the product might be useful or useless or whatever right many people have their opinions on it the fact that kunal shah is doing it means people won't write it off right and that trust gets transferred so i feel like trust is we live in a trust deficient economy and content is the only way to beat that you can't beat it with ads and ads are anyway getting 10 times more expensive yeah and uh, uh, the proof of that is kunal shah being i think the only indian to be featured on farnam street by shane parish mm. right so so it's very difficult I the, just... yeah i saw the knowledge project see that's another thing right like just an example of of content you see the knowledge project now if kunal shah was a saas entrepreneur yeah. and i had a problem which kunal shah's product solved 99.9% of the time i'd use kunal shah's product than any other product because i don't know any of the other products you could run ads and i could go to google and type community products and you'll see ads you don't know any of the products and anyone can run ads and you know and i know that anyone can run ads we yeah. don't trust any of them right so for me the content plays trust by the end of this decade you are going to trust me and avalon and my content more than anybody else right and then i'm going to sell you community product then i'm going to sell you okay you have a problem with video i will teach you you know i will i will have a product for video right like an in video right then i will have a like i'll have i'll have an entire suite for uh anyone who is like me who is a content creator turned educator turned entrepreneur that's it right and i think there are enough like this pattern that i'm going through like i said right like when when you created enough yeah. content you know you're not special right i know there are so many people like me that it's a it's a large enough market now the question is is that a 10 mil arr market or a 100 mil arr market that i don't know and because it's so new i don't have a sense of it right yeah. uh, but i feel it it might expand and and you know worst case scenario i'll build a suite for it now now it depends on what's their spending capacity am i going slightly more enterprise what are the ent- you know enterprise problems because recently i met this guy from who joined slice right he is a content creator who joined slice right he calls himself chief team officer at slice and i know that if choosing a community platform was a thing he would make that choice and if he made that choice he trust me because he yeah. follows my content right so it's like i said content is very powerful right and and i feel people are sleeping on it uh, and that's why i continue to create i feel like distribution it's easier and easier to get to build a product if you have to build scenes 10 years ago it would take you 5 years right scenes now took us a year little more than a year to build right uh, in 5 months or let's say another few years a platform like scenes is going to get even easier like what is the hard part in saas tell me right now there's like if you want to build a cross platform you want to build mobile web and let's say desktop use a flutter right uh, you can hire engineers from all over the world right talent is open lots of open source tools right you want to do for example authentication when i was 13 if you want to do authentication username password that's like a two week job today if you want to do authentication uh, we use a, our back end mm-hmm. tech rails ruby on rails right mm-hmm. so you can use either there's a tool called device in ruby on rails is a gem called device in ruby on rails or you can go and use auth0 or, or any oauth based solution plethora of tools for everything right everyone's made like these microservices that you can just api together right like you can just stitch the apis together in fact scenes the the real product is in in my head is like a visual api connector we have got so many different apis and we connect them together in one visual format so that you don't need to use zapier and build the front ends yourself right um if it's if that's getting easier what's getting harder it's getting users right that's why vcs are so concerned about how you're going to do gtm how you're going to get customers and that's the least of our problems because when you've done content in one sphere you can do it in multiple other spheres right in fact we have a content series with sal yusuf for scenes right where we talk about how to use the platform it's so entertaining it's so entertaining you will have a laugh right watching it and obviously sal yusuf has an american accent and there's a reason for that right because like i told you before there's some in saas also there is some little bit of racism if you're an indian yeah. presenting on screen nobody cares uh, nobody wants to like th- then your trust goes minus minus it doesn't matter if you're an indian ceo talking about stuff that people will trust but if your content on your website is very indianish and indian accent it's like it's not physically indian it's culturally indian if it's culturally indian then you get into a little bit of trouble right where your trust you get like you lose some po- brownie points um so yeah that's why we create content uh, that's why you know we're trying to we think there's a big business here and uh, they're not mutually exclusive no it's been a fantastic uh, listening to you varun uh, i learned a lot being a content creator being an entrepreneur and 
now these lessons also apply to venture capital uh, right uh, especially on the trust right uh, the things you mentioned on trust deficit for me journey of win 100x entrepreneur has been learning right so and it's still you know it's the same entrepreneur who sold his company but thought that next time how do i become you know sell it for 100x the only way to grow that to that level is become 100x of himself yeah. so so that's the journey i'm living and i'm living on this podcast with my <laughs> listeners yeah whenever you yeah. plan to build a community next i know what's going to pop into your head i hope <laughs> right i hope scene is going to pop into your head and to everyone yeah, listening yeah. as well yeah yeah thank thanks a lot you know really enjoyed this conversation likewise thank you for inviting me